Hi, everybody. Um, so right before we get started, um, I just want to say quickly um, for the best viewing experience for today's event, um, if you could go to the little carrot next to stop video, um, go to video settings and hit hide non video participants. Um, it'll make sure that you are only seeing the people that are speaking um, for today's event. Um, and before I kick over to our VP of program strategy, um, Andrea Stevenson Connor. Um, I just want to say that we encourage conversation in the chat. Um, if you want to introduce yourselves, share resources or uh, any upcoming events, um, and of course, any questions that you have for the panel, um, feel free to drop them in the chat um, and we'll integrate them into the conversation today. And with that, I will lead, I will turn things over to Andrea Stevenson Connor. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling in from. I hope we have a broad um, constituency from around the world here with us today. Um, as Ali said, I'm Andrea Stevenson Connor. I'm a member of the Springboard Programs team, and I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about women's health, um, particularly in the bone and aging sector. So just a little bit about Springboard. Next slide, thanks, Sally. So Springboard is a 22-year-old nonprofit. Um, we're focused on accelerating women-led startups that are innovating in the technology and life sciences sector. We're a community and ecosystem of influencers that are in that space of um, investing, entrepreneurs, and advising, and we are set to transform industries. As you can see, we have a phenomenal track record, um, 80, 854 companies that have uh, IPO'd over 225 that have had M&A exits, and that um, equates to about um, 37 billion in value. So we're really proud of the work that we have been doing to support female founders. And over the years, we often have heard from um, and worked with many women that are focusing on women's health. And in the recent years, um, in the last couple of years, actually, we've decided to really double down and focus on initiatives with women's health and to really build a strong ecosystem to support that. Go ahead, next slide, Allie. So, it, it's actually started with seven um, innovative leaders around the table um, that started talking about all the issues around women's health. And we felt that if we brought all the stakeholders together to be able to really put that collective energy together to, to move forward, the focus on women's health, that we could have an impact. And the, the coalition is now two years old and we are absolutely seeing that impact with uh, you know, the cross section of our partners um, and members that are engaged in this coalition. Um, not too long ago, our CEO, Natalie Buford Young and some of the coalition members uh, testified before Congress to you know, talk about women's health. That's really important to you know, be able to put a voice to what is happening with, from the patient, um, the provider, the entrepreneur and the investor lens. So we have, um, go ahead and switch to next slide. Uh, so we have um, focused on seven segments of the women's health sector. Autoimmune was in, in March, April we, last month, we focused on gynecological and sexual health. Today, we're here talking about bone health and aging. Um, in June on the 29th, we'll be focusing on reproductive health and cardiovascular health and oncology. So really important issues for women, your sisters, your mothers, um, your wives, your siblings, all everybody that um, is in your life are being impacted by these issues. So it's really important for us to have a com conversation and dialogue around these issues. All right, but one of the things that we, after having a successful kickoff year last year, we pivoted and wanted to really bring together the patient voice so that we were hearing from the people that were struggling um, with these various conditions. And then also from the founders and funders perspective so that you have the whole ecosystem innovating and collaborating together. 
Um, and you'll hear a little bit later from our partner G2G, who is kind of that advocacy arm that helps to keep us informed on policies and processes that are involved with women's health funding and investing and to be able to, you know, awareness around grants. So I'm excited for you to be able to hear from our, the team from G2G in a little bit. Um, so I'd like to pivot for a second and turn it over to uh, our collaborative partner, um, Stephanie Sassman from Roche to tell you about their support of the coalition and um, why they're here. Take it away, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Andrea. And it's really exciting uh, to be here. And this is the, our second year at, as Roche um, supporting um, Springboard and the Women's Health Innovation Coalition. Um, and you know, at Roche, we are truly on a mission. Um, I think a mission that all of you share or you wouldn't be here um, to transform women's health across diseases. Um, and we are you know, in it really to leverage our expertise in developing both diagnostics and medicines, and of course, partnering with other stakeholders um, to really um, deliver a transformative, um, transformative options for women um, across the patient journey. Um, my name is Stephanie Sassman. I am our portfolio lead uh, for women's health. I'm based in the US, and I'm also joined by Andrea, um, who is from our Roche Diagnostics team, um, working specifically on diagnostics for bone health, um, and he's based in Switzerland. And you know, one of the reasons we're so passionate about this is because we truly cannot bring forward personalized healthcare if we continue to act like men are the default humans. And it's really shocking and unacceptable um, is that women's health outside of oncology accounts for only about 1% of R&D funding uh, for healthcare products and services. And it really makes no sense because women's health is population health. Women are the chief medical officers of their families making 90% of the healthcare decisions. Um, and they also have a much higher likelihood of engaging in digital health tools. So we cannot ignore women, um, but we do know that women tend to put themselves last. Um, and so I'm really glad um, that Springboard Enterprises um, has brought together this women's health coalition so we can look at how we can put women first. And really, this is from discovery um, all the way through care delivery. Um, we have to be able to keep women at the center of what we do so we can bring forward care that is more centered around her and not centered around um, men as the default humans. And really that has to come from starting with a place of empathy and understanding the experiences that women have as they interact with healthcare providers and stakeholders. Um, and that allows us to really understand the, the challenges that they're facing and develop solutions that actually meet those challenges. And we know from a bone health perspective that one in two women 50% of women will experience in their lifetime a devastating fracture. This is a greater risk than heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer combined. We're talking about 2 million broken bones and uh, over 19 billion in related costs each year, and that's probably an underestimate. And each one of these women is, is, our, is a mother. Um, it's a wife it's a sister, it's a friend, um, it's personal. And, and that's why you know, we're also very happy to be supporting Springboard as for too long, um, you know, these innovations, um, they haven't been led in a women-centered way. And who better to lead the change than women entrepreneurs and also funders that are, that are females and that are investing in women's health. And we really need to be, um, able to come together and Springboard provides such an important platform so we can have these important conversations about how we can learn from each other, how we can bring these new health innovations forward for women and also make sure that funding is allocated. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Andrea, um, and about the testifying that was done before Congress because 
there needs to be funding towards this. Um, it's going to pay off in dividends uh, for society. Um, this is not just an altruistic thing. This is a thing that is good for society and it's good for business to make sure that there is research and development and, and great funding support and great funding for female entrepreneurs who are developing these medicines, diagnostics, digital tools, um, and making sure that women have broad access to them. Um, so, you know, those of us at Roche and Genentech are really proud to be sponsoring with Springboard. Uh, we thank you for all of your efforts to innovate in the space, and we look forward to an exciting session. Thank you, Stephanie. We cannot thank you enough for your partnership um, on this journey. It, it definitely takes a village and a community to ignite change, and um, Roche, Genentech, and you personally have been great supporters for us. So thank you so much for being here with us. All right, so um, we are going to start out with talking about the patient perspective and the organizations that are kind of advocating and helping us have that voice to, to be able to you know talk and hear what the patients are going through. So I'd like to welcome to our virtual stage here, Andrea Medeiros who is the Senior Director of Public Policy, Health and Public Policy at Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, and Cheryl Birch Hoshnick, who is the Executive Director of the American Bone Health. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. So I would love to start off with if you could just each just briefly tell, tell us a little bit about the advocacy um, that your organizations are focused on, and then um, then we'll dive into some of the questions. Do you want to get Cheryl? Excellent. Yes, thank you. So our mission at American Bone Health is to engage, educate, and empower people to really build and keep strong bones for a life. And what we are doing is really working with people in the community to reach everyone to help them understand what they need to know about their own personal risk factors for weakened bones and fractures, and then helping them put together everything that they need to have a conversation with their healthcare provider, as well as take the steps that they need to take to keep their bones strong. Um, we're really trying to fill that gap where there isn't somebody having the conversation with people across their lifespan about why they need to take care of their bones. Oh, Andrea, I can't hear you. Thank you for letting me know, Cheryl. Um, thank you, Cheryl, so much. And Andrea. Hi, so at BHOF, uh, we provide patient tools along with clinician, um, clinician education as well. So we wanna make sure clinicians are involved to make sure they have the right education they need for the, to provide to the patients. On the patient side, we also have information for caregivers and we have a policy institute. So we try to make sure we're advocating on that end as well, along with everything else Cheryl mentioned. We kind of do the same thing with a patient education, making sure they have all the tools throughout the lifespan. Excellent. So let's, let's start off with, um, what do you want women who are suffering from bone related conditions like osteoporosis um, and other conditions associated with aging like menopause to know? What do we need to know? So an important part on our end, women don't really know that they can lose up 20% of their bone density in the first five to seven years post menopause due to the loss of estrogen. So it's a really important marker that you need to make sure you're going to the doctor at that moment, finding out what's going on with bone density. Do you have any other risk factors involved? Was that to be talked with your health provider because any other concerns you may have and determining if treatment is necessary at that point or where you may need treatment in the further end because there's no single remedy for osteoporosis it's a whole person approach including nutrition exercise and fall prevention and also overall dealing with a chronic condition is can be very scary so you make sure to ask for your family and friends for support we also provide um bhof support groups in different areas and our online community Thank you. How about you, Cheryl? I, I think um, I definitely, you know, we definitely agree. We're, we're very aligned on that, that it's, it's really 
important to know what you need to do and that you are going to lose that bone around menopause. Um, one thing that we really advocate for along with knowing your risk factors is making sure that you understand um, where your bone density is at before you go through menopause. Um, because with that loss of up to 20% of your bone density around perimenopause and menopause, um, you need to know where you start so that you can see how much you're losing and put a plan in place to really do as much as you can to keep your bones as strong as possible. And I think one thing that we want everyone to know, um, we, you, know, you know, we talk to a lot of people, we have a helpline for people and people get really scared when they get diagnosed with osteoporosis because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to bump into something. This is gonna change my life. I can't do the things that I wanna do. And so what we really want people to know is that there is a lot that you can do. And um, to help them through that and to keep people um, living their lives the way that they want to. So what would you say if you, if you are, um, you just found out that you, you're perimenopausal or that you, you, ha you have osteoporosis and you didn't have that bone scan before, what would be the, what would you recommend that uh, a woman do? Or a man, we know that men can also suffer from osteoporosis. Yes, so it, it's really important um, that you get uh, adequate nutrition. So you need to make sure that you're getting adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D every day, um, that you are staying active and, and doing weight bearing and muscle strengthening activities, and that you're working through this plan with your healthcare provider. If you have osteoporosis, um, you should be creating, we, we tell people we'd like them to have a bone health plan that they create with their healthcare provider. So um, it involves the healthy eating, the activity, what you can do to prevent falls um, and lifestyle things that you should avoid, like smoking is bad for your bones. Don't consume too much alcohol. Um, and then of course, whether or not you need a bone strengthening medication. And so um, really working with your healthcare provider around all of that and go in armed with um, questions, specific questions. Um, we've got great resources around what should be talking to your healthcare provider about and kind of do your homework before you go in and make sure that you're getting the most out of that visit. Because one of the challenges that we have in this space is that bone health is not something that's being set aside with time for healthcare providers to talk about. And our healthcare providers are so stretched with their time, um, but you really have to make it a priority for a conversation. Thank you, Cheryl. Everything Cheryl mentioned. It's also just once it going to the appointment, asking the provider also like, okay, how does this all affect my overall health? And then hopefully they mentioned bone health, but also you being prepared beforehand, knowing about that it can affect your bone health and it can affect everything else and what's going on with your hormones so they can be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. So what are the biggest roadblocks that you're running up against in your advocacy work? And how can we, as this Women's Health Innovation Coalition, our audience here today, take action to support you in the work that you're doing with those roadblocks? So our biggest roadblocks are getting Congress and administration to prioritize policies that would improve bone health and post-fracture care. So an example of how audience can help be helpful is contacting representatives about um, House Resolution 3517 and Senate Resolution 1943. So this calls for increasing the access to osteoporosis testing for Medicare beneficiaries by raising the reimbursement rates for bone density scans. So usually they're called DEXA, but there are a few other bone density scans as well. Can we put those um, bills in the chat, um, Allie, so that our audience sees those bill numbers and they can recite them? How about you, Cheryl? Um, I certainly, uh, you know, we're, we're working on trying to get that policy work through too as well. And I would say it's one of the biggest challenges is apathy towards bone health and um, getting people, it, even, getting people who have osteoporosis 
to speak up. Um, there is this stigma around osteoporosis as a disease that shows that you're aging. And, and there are a lot of people who don't want to admit that, but osteoporosis can impact people at all ages. And there are lots of medical conditions and medicines that can weaken bones. And of course it is. Um, aging is a huge risk factor for osteoporosis, but you heard the numbers when we started this session today that there are more women who will break a bone due to osteoporosis every year than new cases of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke combined. So why is this not a national priority? We have um, an immense amount of money that goes towards preventing stroke and heart attack, um, but we do not have the focus on bone health. And so I think anything that we can do to raise bone health as an important issue, and particularly as our population's aging, is incredibly important. Totally agree. Totally agree. All right, so another question for you. Um, it is often said that the aging experience for women um, can be characterized as suffering in silence from discomfort, uh, having conversation with your doctor. So you, you mentioned how important that is to lack of education on female specific conditions. Um, you know, a lot of women don't even think about their bones in their younger years so much. Um, lack of education on um, avoiding these conversations because like you said, you don't want to, you're embarrassed. I don't, you know, we're, we're fighting the signs of aging all the time, but we don't, we look at the outside, but we don't, you know, we don't think about the inside. Um, how can women better advocate for themselves? Um, you, you mentioned those conversations with your, your, the doctor, but what else, how else can we be good advocates for ourselves? So on my end, I always think of my family. My mom has osteopenia, my grandmother's osteoporosis. So women are always frequently seen as a caregiver too. But when you remember, if we can't take care of ourselves first, how can, without us being optimal health, how can we help others? So it's kind of that point of, this relates to bone health and aging, but anything else going on, we need to make sure we take care of ourselves first. And like, it's a whole, whole thing that we don't always want to take care of ourselves, especially with aging. It's like, oh, it'll just happen over time. We don't have to worry about it. I'm like, no, it's important. Um, so BHOF, we provide tools to, for patients and caregivers, as mentioned before, to help educate them on the importance of bone health throughout the lifespan, starting with peak bone mass, which is well, mentioned as well later on, but it's pretty much your optimal bone health that we have to start earlier on. So it's not just a aging disease. It's technically more, we see like as a pediatric disease with the onset and your aging part, like it comes out later on versus it's not just because we got older. Um, but yeah, we want people to be empowered to discuss their own healthcare needs with their healthcare provider through all the tools we provide. Cheryl, you want to add anything? Yes, um, and I totally agree with Andrea and all of those points. Um, we also need to empower people to do health assessments on themselves. And, and so talk to, take care of yourself, but also make sure you're having these conversations with your girlfriends um, and with your colleagues and with many people are parents of children. Like the conversations aren't happening about the impact there. Um, we do have a tool for people who are age 45 plus, a validated health assessment risk tool for people that, where you can take about two minutes, answer some questions about your own personal risk factors and you will get a 10 year risk of breaking a bone. And we provide all kinds of resources to go with this, but you get a, a graph that you can use along with information to have that conversation with your healthcare provider about your risk factors. So um, I think telling everyone that you know, like even just asking, hey, have you had a DEXA scan? How are your bones? Um, what do you know about bone health? Absolutely. So in your experience with working with patients, um, what information do patients wish they knew before they developed osteoporosis or osteopenia? And how can 
we educate ourselves better to understand what those that information that we need to know. And I I'll, I'll, I'm guessing you'll probably cover, but I'll ask you if you don't, if you don't about the, what are, what's a good marker and, you know, when do you know you're at risk? Who wants to take that first? Do you want to go first, Andrea? Okay. Um, so most people don't know the risk factors overall for osteoporosis and some are which are uncontrollable, such as gender, family history, and having a small body frame. So it's just some things we can control and some things we can't. That's, one portion um and we wish that everyone knew that under and understood that fractures from falls are not a normal part of aging falling from a standing height you should not you should be, not bounce back but you shouldn't fracture immediately that's a major sign of osteoporosis having low bone mass so we need to remember that as well because there are younger people who can fract fall down and fracture from standing height i feel like i'm already towards that part of my life i'm not even that old yet <laughs> <laughs> so it's an important thing to remember like okay that's something wrong and most doctors don't realize they're like oh well you're still young it's fine we'll do a bone density scan later i'm like you know i know some people who got diagnosed at 18 at 28 it's just you have if there's certain signs you have to take care of it if they're not advocating for you you have to advocate for yourself and then um i mentioned beforehand peak bone mass so pretty much we build most of our bone our strongest bone by the time of our early 20s and after that, our bodies break down, we build new bones for the rest of our lives, but that process slows down as we age. So we start kind of going downwards. So we need to make sure we're at like high, best nutrition, exercise and maintaining and making sure we can, we're monitoring that as well. But you, Cheryl, what, yeah. what, what other things would be, you know, important? I, I think it's, you know, I just want to, re-emphasize those risk factors. In fact, we were out at uh, a large event um, just a week and a half ago. And I, you know, it was so great to be back out in the community and talking with people. And really it was, gosh, I wish I had known that this treatment I was going to take, um, in this case, it was for breast cancer, um, was going to impact my bones. I was still going to take the treatment, but I needed to know that I needed to do something with my bones afterwards. So really understanding what those risk factors are outside of just the aging and the family history and um, just making sure that you understand there are things you can do. Um, and I think the other thing that we hear consistently from people is, gosh, I didn't know how it was in, how important it was in those teenage years to make sure that um, the activity and the diet and all of that, how important that was going to be for my bones later in life. So back to this whole life cycle um, spectrum. And I am looking at some of the comments in, in the chat, you know, talking about um, doctors diagnosing earlier. Um, is there, is there a something on each of your website or resources that a patient could go to find and take it to their next checkup appointment? And would that be your GP? Would that be your OBGYN or your endocrinologist or depending on who would be the best person um, to take that information to and where might they find that on your website? Yes, well, I would encourage anyone who's 45 plus to take our fracture risk calculator. And then um, we have all kinds of tools um, on our website as well. Um, a checklist for a visit with your physician, take your fracture risk calculator results because it's going to have all your risk factors. Um, and you can find that at AmericanBoneHealth.org. And uh, I think, you know, with regards to who is that healthcare provider, it's going to vary based on who you see. So it could be your GP, it could be your OBGYN. It may be that you're seeing an endocrinologist, um, the specialists who typically specialize in bone are rheumatologists, gerontologists, and endocrinologists. Um, there are some OBGYNs. Uh, we, we definitely need more bone specialists, um, but I think one thing that we encourage is if, if your primary care provider is not comfortable managing bone health, then find a specialist. So 
look towards, you know, search for an endocrinologist that specializes in bone health or find a bone clinic at a healthcare facility near you. And one thing our patients also mentioned a very good easy, if you're having struggle finding a doctor and that get into a weird, I found this doctor, I don't know if they work bone health. It's literally like, okay, let's type in bone health clinic on Google. <laughs> and they've actually found a lot of centers and also like osteopro center as well. So a good Google search because there are, there's no one specific osteopro specialist doctor. There's many different specialists who work in bone. So it's hard to find that one perfect specialist you want for this. So that's the main issue with osteoporosis and finding a right doctor. And I, I, I appreciate you giving us that list of the various doctors, cause you're right. There is, it's not, there's not just one doctor that you can go to. It, it really needs to be an integrated conversation across all of your healthcare professionals to make sure that it is flagged that you are, have osteoporosis or osteopenia so that they can, um, I'm trying to think somebody commented about being on a breast cancer medication and, um, you know, understanding by taking that medication, you know, the impacts, but they don't always tell you, of course, you're not going to, you know, turn down something that's going to impact breast cancer, but it is yeah. really good for somebody to tell you or to be told that it is going to have an impact on your bone health and to have some strategies to be able to offset that. So th thank you so much, Cheryl, for sharing that. Um, Springboard team, can we put a link in the chat for the bone risk calculator that Cheryl mentioned? That would be really great for people to try. I've, I've done it before and it's, a, it's really a great tool. It was actually, re it's reassuring to be able to see kind of based on your various risks, but you know, knowledge is power and it gives you a solution forward. So we have just a couple of minutes left. Are there any like last minute things that would be really helpful for our audience to know, Cheryl and Andrea? Definitely both of us have many, many resources. So definitely check our websites out. Um, we'll both put the links in the chat because it just, as long as you're, you have to educate yourself. That's, which is a weird, has a horrible thing to be like, you will hope your doctor educates you, but we have to advocate for ourselves in any part of our health. Absolutely, I, I echo that. Um, both of our organizations have great resources and um, I encourage everybody to um, understand what you need to do for your bones. We can't, we can't feel if our bones are getting weak um, and they're incredibly important to us. You know, they protect our organs, they help us move, they hold us up and we all want to live long, active, productive lives. So um, just encourage everyone to understand what they can do. And it's all part of a healthy, healthy lifestyle. So, you know, whatever you're doing, that's good for your heart or, you know, to live a healthy lifestyle is probably going to be good for your bones. So it's not like, oh, you have to add a lot more on, but you need to make sure that you're, you're, you know, getting that calcium and vitamin D. Cause if, if you're not getting that calcium, your body's going to take it from your bones to um, do, do other things that your body needs. So I guess that would be my, my final word. Yep, and, I, and I've read that, um, at least in the United States, because of the sunscreens, sometimes we're not getting enough vitamin D and that there's, there are risks. A lot of people find that they're vitamin D deficient. Is there any else, anything else that um, you're hearing in that regard that might be blocking people from getting some of that, you know, vitamin D that they need to get? Well, we, we typically don't, you know, a lot of across the United States, um, people, eat, most people can't get enough vitamin D from the sunshine. And um, oftentimes you may not get enough from your diet. A lot of foods are fortified with vitamin D, but once again, this is something to talk to your healthcare provider about. Are you getting enough vitamin D. And with regards to your bones, the reason you need the vitamin D is because your body cannot absorb the calcium without the vitamin D. So it, it is critical, um, but we always encourage people to have that conversation with their healthcare provider. Excellent. Thank you both so much for 
all the work that you're doing to make sure that we're advocating and we have a resource to to find out ways to be our own best advocates. Appreciate you joining us today, Cheryl. All right, Thank you. so Thank we you. are now Thank going you so much. To, oh, you're very, very welcome. So we are now going to pivot to, we, we now understand the challenges that are out there and where there are opportunities for innovation. So I'd like to welcome um, Elaine and Karen, Sarah, Laura and Liz to join us. And we're gonna talk from the funder and founder perspective. Um, but first I'd love for each of you to briefly describe your company and its mission in relation to women's bone health and aging. Um, Liz, I'm seeing you first on the PowerPoint to my left. I'm gonna go with you first. Sure, sounds great. Great to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Klo. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Everly Health. It's a company that owns a few conglomerates of Everly Well, which is a home diagnostic company. In addition to Natalist, it's a fertility women's health brand. Um, and I just love to hearing the speakers today because we um, have vitamin D supplements and including vitamin D tests at home. And we're just excited. Um, my quick background is I'm a physician by training, but have been a serial entrepreneur in the digital health space. I uh, started a few telehealth companies and also used to work at American Well. Um, during the pandemic, we've been really focused on educating consumers and patients on empowering them to do testing at home. Our uh, current offerings include everything from women's health, fertility, to pre uh, menopause, to premenopause, and anything that in between with regards to um, diabetes and whatnot. So open to hearing more, but looking forward to this desk in day. Thanks, Liz. Elaine, would you mind going next? Well, I'm Elaine Baldy, and I'm the lead venture partner in Portfolio's Active Aging and Longevity Fund. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel with also two portfolio invested companies, uh, both Laurel from Bone Health and Liz from Everly Health. Those are both in different funds in Portfolio. Um, the Active Aging and Longevity Fund is really targeted at the issues around the 55 plus population and all the range of things that impact um, older adults. As we began our focus on our fund, we were looking at the areas where, that were underfunded, not getting a lot of attention. And in particular, one of the issues are the issues around women, whether it's around women's health from the most basic of bone health, as we've talked about, uh, from testing, their role as caregivers, the fact that they're not primary in a lot of um, research. So we wanted to find sort of un unpopular in that they weren't getting a lot of attention, not that they weren't, they didn't require a great deal of attention, areas to really invest in and grow. And that's really what we've done over the, the last two years in the fund. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Lane. Sarah, would you mind introducing yourself next? Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah Dillingham, and I'm the founder and CEO of Grace and Able. And we make better joint support for women with arthritis so that they can keep doing all the things they love. And our product range includes colorful compression gloves and also our patented wrist brace that has a unique special splint. And it's super easy to take on and off. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Karen. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm one of the founding members of Astia Angels. Astia, excuse me, Astia is a global nonprofit that focuses on supporting high potential female founders through mentorship and funding. We have three different funding vehicles. We have a fund for follow on investing a little later stage. We have Astia Angels, an early stage investor, which is an investor in Bone Health Technologies, the company Laura is running, as well as an investor in some of the other companies that are represented by people who are, who've been showing up in the chat. Um, and our Astia Edge program, our newest offering, which is focused on providing matching funds to women of color for whom access to funding has been even worse than for women in, in total. We do focus broadly. About a third of our investments are in healthcare, and a lot of those have been in women's health. Thank you so much, Karen. And last but not least, Laura. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. Um, I'm CEO of Bone Health Technologies. And 
We are a clinical stage company. We have a device called OsteoBoost, which is a wearable um, vibration treatment. So we've leveraged years of uh, NASA funded research into using whole body vibration to improve bone density. And we have put this vibration technology into a wearable belt form factor. We're also building um, a comprehensive uh, bone health um, digital platform. So a combined sort of digital therapeutic intervention and a treatment. And I think what's really interesting about what we're building is our clinical uh, trial, our pivotal trial is for postmenopausal women with osteopenia. And right now, if you are diagnosed with osteopenia, um, generally speaking, medication is not yet indicated. Um, given sort of the way the medications work and their safety profile, their um, profile, they're really reserved primarily for osteoporosis. And so you get this osteopenia diagnosis and then your doctor says, well, you know, make sure you're getting your calcium and vitamin D and keep exercising. And what if the answer is, well, that's what I've been doing and I'm still losing my bone, right? The, you know, 20% that many women lose during menopause, that's an important time to be active, actively um, treating this. So we're excited that I think we have the possibility of a safe and effective uh, treatment for um, osteopenia. And the mechanism, mechanism of action is such that we expect to be able to show in the future that it's effective for osteoporosis adjunctively with medication um, and as well as for men. Because essentially the vibration is simulating exercise. Um, in terms of me personally, my background is 25 years in tech, both enterprise software and leading major consumer brands such as Netscape, uh, Yahoo Mail. I was CEO of a couple of consumer tech startups that um, were acquired. Uh, I sold one of those companies to Apple and that technology is the foundation of the Apple Watch. And then for the last um, six or seven years, I've been working in health technology and really excited to be able to work, to be able to work on this important problem. Excellent, thank you so much, Laura. All right, so I'm gonna transport us, um, Elaine and Karen. We're um, here sitting in a, a pitch session and we're all standing there, everybody's, and you think to yourself, wow, this is a company we wanna get behind. What stood out to you during that pitch? Do you want to go first, Elaine? Sure. I think it's going to be a combination of three things. First of all, the team that is working on the problem really knows what they're talking about. They really have the expertise and the will to really make it happen. Secondly, they are solving a real problem. It's not just a minor issue. I mean, what we've been talking about today, the issue about bone health is a perfect example. And this is a major issue, not a lot of you know, attention being paid to it, and they can make a real difference. And thirdly, that there's, it's a large enough market that if they are successful, they will have the exit because as an investor, you know, it's does this deal allow us to have the right investor? And overriding all of this is that, are we building the world we want to be and the world we really want to have? So is it that greater umbrella? For me, there were a couple of factors as well. The first is that I'm in the, I'm in the target demographic and this spoke to me. Uh, I'm somebody who um, for my whole life, I haven't been able to consume dairy. And I think back about how important it was to be building my, my bones as a teenager and even before that. And I probably didn't do a very good job because at that, when I was growing up, things weren't calcium fortified and vitamin D fortified. So my bones probably never hit the peak that they could have. And for, for a number of other reasons, medication use, et cetera, I'm definitely in this target market. I'm also somebody who has researched the bone medications and I'm very reluctant to take them because of the side effect profile. And when I learned that this is an area, I mean, medication adherence is a huge issue for our system in general, but the stats in the bone health space are horrific. Laura has the exact numbers and probably others on this call do as well, but <clears throat> the percent of women who are willing to take their prescribed medications is, is pretty low. 
because women recognize that this is this is an industry we're being fed medication because there's no other there's no other option that may may or may not be optimal and then i'd say the third factor is osteopenia is as laura was just was just stating a complete white space there is no therapy the medication isn't appropriate because the risks are too high and there's there's nothing else to do other than keep doing what you're what you're doing so that makes it enormously attractive i think as an as an investor Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Elaine, uh, you were involved with um, Everly Well. What, what stood out about the Everly Well presentation? Well, what was fortunate for us on Everly Well, uh, Everly Well, probably of all the companies we're talking to, they are the, is the furthest along. You know, they are, they have grown, they have been so wise in what they were doing, and that they are making a huge difference across a wide range of health issues and specifically women's health issues. Uh, the leadership team, you know, just blows, totally blows you away. And also in all candidate, it was an opportunity for us to get involved in a later stage here. You know, we weren't involved, I wish we were right at the very beginning because that was <clears throat> predates actually our fund. Uh, but the fact that we were able to participate in a later stage round, which very often men, many, <clears throat> excuse me, many of our groups like ASCII and others, we can get in early, but we can't get in at the later stage deals. And so that opportunity to be involved, which is really great for our portfolio within portfolio activating in terms of having this a range of products was excellent. Excellent, awesome. So I want to I want to pivot to our entrepreneurs now, um, Laura, Sarah, and Liz. You heard from the patient advocacy organizations that um, focusing on conditions in bone health and aging. What inspired you to build or you know join these companies and that you're working with, and what's the story behind these solutions? Uh, Sarah, why don't you start with that? Sure. So, okay, so arthritis is the leading cause of disability in the USA. And the majority of patients are women over 40. And I'm one of them. And on top of that, I actually also have low bone density, thanks to taking prednisone for years. So it was really interesting hearing some of the stuff earlier this morning. Now, a lot of patients with arthritis like using orthopedic bracing and joint support products because they stabilize and support joints and they reduce pain and swelling but without having to take any other medications that could cause a side effect. But the problem is that most of these products, they're just not designed for us. They're not designed to meet our needs. So people don't wear them. They take them off because they're uncomfortable, because they're ugly, and that means they don't get the medical benefit. And we see this confirmed in medical data, which shows that these products have a terrible compliance rate. So I actually started customizing my own product and I actually wore a wrist brace on my wedding day that I customized. And I accidentally discovered lots of other women emailing me saying, could you make something for me? So I got together with a hand therapist to develop our first product. And it was during that process that I realized that this isn't just an underserved market. This is a market that's being completely ignored by many major companies not just in terms of the product development, but also in terms of the way they market and sell to this market. And that's a shame because it's worth about $800 million here in the US and it's growing at a rate of 6%. Wow, that's, it seems like a very impressive market size that um, you, yeah. know, you all are working in. And where, so there's some great opportunity. I think that's where there's a, this, bringing the advocacy side and the innovation side can really have an, have an impact. So thank you so much, Sarah. Liz, why don't you tell us next? Sure, it sounds great. Uh, you know, just hearing all the speakers, it was very, very um, exciting to talk about what is um, this a concept of just women not only thinking about their care for themselves and delaying care, and especially during the pandemic, widening of many care gaps. So things such as like breast mammograms and colonoscopies that are being delayed, 
but also this idea of um, consumers and how we think of patients as being able to access testing in a convenient and affordable manner. So one of the things that draw, drew me to Everly Well as a company was this idea of um, test-focused, people-focused diagnostic-driven care in the home and creating an affordable test from everywhere, anywhere from $49 to $200 in food sensitivities and figuring out um, vitamin D levels and thinking a lot more about your own health and taking health into your own hands. Um, my goal, especially as the chief medical officer at Everly is to think through how do we generate additional tests that really speak to the target and patient population that we're helping, especially to think about affordable care. How do we make labs in the home easy to use? And even STIs, um, we do a lot of sexual health testing and making sure that people feel that the data is personalized and the navigation tools are easy to use. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Did, did you want to add something else? No, I just was, I, I don't know if there's a question, but my, I think um, just echoing a lot of what the speakers are saying and making sure that we help transform patient care in um, getting people the right care at the right test in the comforts of their own place. That, you know, wherever they need to get care, it's making it easy. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Liz. Laura, so I was um, scan looking at a number of checking you all out last night and looking at the website. And um, I would love for you to you know, tell us about the work that you're doing. And then of course, we, uh, Sarah mentioned that, you know, sometimes the innovation doesn't look attractive. So I wanna know, Laura, can I get your device in other colors? Uh, coming soon. Okay, soon. Awesome. Um, so, so in terms of the origin story of our device, um, and I didn't, I was not one of the founders. I joined more recently as we started to look towards the patient journaling and the commercialization. Um, uh, there's um, Dr. Shane Mangrum is a physical medicine and rehab doctor. Um, he's a partner in a medical device incubator, primary and clinical practice. And he was seeing a lot of patients uh, with vertebral fractures, which are very debilitating, very painful, hard to prevent, hard to treat. And he just became really interested and, you know, wanted to see if there was some way to uh, prevent these or get to, and most of them are related to bone, bone density. And so he dug into the research on vibration, um, saw that there was low compliance with whole body vibration platforms, although the science on the mechanism of action was good. And he partnered with uh, Dan Burnett, who's the CEO of this medical device incubator, Theranova. And they did a lot of prototyping, but came up with the concept that is what we're working with now on using a belt because the vibration pack is targeting the hips and lumbar spine, which are the you know, parts of the body that have these most devastating fractures. So you're really solving the convenience issue um, because it's a comfortable wearable. And then the, you know, really focusing the vibration. We've got some government grants. So in our case, at least, we have um, been fortunate to be able to attract some government funding. Um, you know, Medicare is paying a lot of money for these fractures, and they're rational about that. Um, for the proof of concept, where we tested a blood biomarker, that led to um, a large grant to do the pivotal trial, which we're almost done with. Um, so in terms of why I joined, you know, I was listening to Elaine and Karen and it's like, well, that's pretty much why I joined. This is the same reason why they invested because, um, you know, I'm investing my time. I'm investing my energy. Startups are hard. You have to be passionate about it. And when I saw the size of the unmet need, the only thing I needed to ask was what is the possibility that this is going to work? And then I dug into the science and I was hooked from there. Um, so, you know, now the journey since then, we've raised some, um, in, you know, equity capital to allow us to um, build out the device, do a new version to make it more consumer friendly. To your question, Andrea, yes, there will be colors. There's a new design that has the same mechanism of action. There's a companion app, and we're, you know, really getting ready to bring this to market. And my background, um, you know, early in the tech world was around commercialization, and then for the last five to seven years really bringing um, health technologies uh, to market. So, and we're you know so glad to have this community here so we can support each other. Well, and we're thrilled to have you in this community for sure. So 
Laura mentioned a little bit of kind of what's next for them. I'd love Sarah and Liz kind of give us a stage of what's next for your company's growth and the impact that the area of um, women's health specifically. Yeah, so for the, we've been out to market for about eight months now, and we spent that eight months really building the foundation of our business with developing the relationships with our production partners and our customers. And that means we can now start looking at new products. And our big driving force is around normalizing the wearing of joint support products, just like it's completely normal to wear glasses, for example. So we're working on two products right now. The first one is a low profile thumb brace, and that's designed for the 39% of postmenopausal women who will end up with some kind of degenerative arthritis at the base of the thumb. And then our second product, we've been recently awarded a non-dilutive grant from an organization called Hello Alice, and that's to develop compression gloves in skin tone shades to sell alongside our colorful gloves. And the thinking behind that is that not everybody wants to wear color. Some people want to wear gloves that look more discreet, but a lot of the medical products out there are made in this really horrible, weird beige color that nobody likes. So we are spending some time to develop colors that are accurate to different people's skin tones. So hot pink is a color. <laughs> Liz, how about you? What's going on at Everly Well? What's ahead? What's ahead? Sure. You know, we started as a health and wellness brand, and these days we've been focused a lot more on getting reimbursed. And so, as you know, um, a lot of companies do when you first start out thinking direct to consumer, and now can we get payer to reimburse or CMS or other types of organizations? So right now we're looking at that. Um, you know, in general, we know that 70% of today's medical decisions depend on laboratory results. So we're hoping that we can really push more accurate diagnosis with the telehealth platform. We know also a lot of millennials say they wouldn't really go to a provider if they don't have telehealth services. So we're building out our telehealth practice um, in all 50 states. Also thinking a lot more about how to help people understand what is an unexpected medical bill do. Like for example, um, how do you minimize any kind of um, lab tests that you didn't know about or other diagnoses um, that are pertinent to you? So we're using data to digitize a lot of this, um, what I call the four Ps. It's preventative, it's predictive, it's personalized, and ultimately I could be prescriptive. So using our telehealth platform to prescribe medication if someone is diagnosed with, um, let's say, diabetes um, as a next step. Um, so very interested in pushing that ahead as um, more broadly to just accelerate our ability to work across different um, ecosystems. So we're also working with CVS, Rite Aid, a lot of these different um, retail stores and Target in addition to direct-to-consumer online branding. Um, but our goal right now today, even to talk to this group, um, it was just wonderful to hear. Uh, our ultimate goal is to really think about the whole continuum of care. So women's health from um, early stages of anything from you know teenagers to all the way to um, as we're thinking about menopause and having a nice suite of services for it. Yeah, and it is it is wonderful to be in a community of people that share your same passion and can bring the you know the the lens to it. So I want to pivot quick to Elaine and Karen. Um, Speaking of kind of that, you know, right now we are in a, com a supportive community that um, supports bone health and aging. It has been described that women's health is a niche market. What, Elaine and Karen, what, um, as investors in this space, what do you wish the broader investment community understood about women's health? And what do you say to somebody when they say, oh, it's, eh, it's a niche market? I'll do two things. And first of all, I want to build on the comment that Stephanie from Roach made, which is, you know, what is the standard as you begin to do medical research or any kind of testing on any medical problem? You know, the default position has been the white um, male uh, European or American extraction, you know, and yet the reality is there are simply more women involved in the world. And so 
to the degree we can reinforce the idea across the board that the norm should be yes, male, but also female because they are two different entities in many regards, I think. And then just looking at the shared numbers of women involved, either because they are suffering from whatever ailment or potentially need to prevent something, or they are the gatekeeper and the caregiver. And so they, again, they have disproportionate impact on the decision-making. And last but not least, they control more of the wealth. When you really get down to the numbers, particularly in an older population. So you wanna go where the market is, the opportunity is, and the money is, and that is women. So I think it's really as simple as that. And just, just the fact that look at all the power that's on this panel today and, and the, the breadth and the overlap and getting that message out there more clearly in terms of what Springboard is doing, what so many others are doing. I think we are seeing a change. You know, 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been all women all the time. You know, now it is and it's becoming more normative. And I would add to that that for many people, the definition of women's health, or people, people define women's health in a lot of different ways. And as we started seeing more investment in this space, a lot of the investment initially went into things that relate to fertility, to sexual health. So the first thing when people tell me this is a niche is not only talking about how prevalent we are, we're the majority of the population, but we're also talking about everything that relates to women's health. And in virtually any condition you can think of, women have different presentations. And I'll use heart disease as an example. Mm -hmm. Women are underdiagnosed. Most women don't understand that their symptoms are going to be very different than the typical elephant on your chest kind of symptom that is described for, for men, that was classified for men. There's been virtually no research. As Elaine was mentioning, I think Stephanie mentioned as well, women specific to cardiovascular disease. And most physicians, many physicians will ignore symptoms that women come in with because they don't even recognize that there could be different symptomology for women. So there are so many areas where the opportunities are gigantic that relate to focusing on how women present with different diseases, not just women specific diseases, but women across all diseases. So when you put all those things together, the opportunity for investors is, it's virtually unlimited. And, and it's a pretty, and it's a really good sized market. But there's just so much opportunity. So it's so important for all of us to be out there advocating and really supporting these entrepreneurs and the innovation that they're that they're working on. Well, you know, and in the bone health space, I mean, for our topic today, um, there are no new drugs in late stage clinical trials. There's trials of existing drugs in different combinations and different ordering, and so that's great. And you know, kudos to the um, researchers, mostly academic, who are doing those trials. Um, so th this is just a huge gap uh, from a health point of view, but um, I think it just, it's an incredible opportunity from, from a business point of view. Uh, if we can prove efficacy and safety, um, there's just tremendous unmet need. We're not having to say, take, take this instead of that, right? This is why our new, you know, knee replacement device is 10% better. This is Greenfield. I also think it's pure recognition of a problem, okay? Because people tend to view the world through their own eyes. And the more women are involved in the research at universities, to Laura's point about who's doing the basic research, as investors, as entrepreneurs, and we know there's a direct correlation between investors and entrepreneurs and the funding things. People invest in people that they can relate to, um, that look like them, think like them a little bit. And this is true across the board now. So I think the more women are gaining their voice even more, um, and it will help push us along even faster. Um, right. People work on problems that are meaningful to them. Right. I think of my late father-in-law, who's an allergist, who grew up with horrible hay fever. Right. <laughs> it motivated him. And that's not an uncommon story. So, you know, I we had a meeting yesterday. We're about to launch a, cl a clinical trial at UCSF. And I looked around the table and there were 
two female endocrinologists, multiple female uh, clinical research associates, um, an engineer. They're really excited to work on this problem because they, they can connect with it. Um, and so, and then that goes back to the funders. I saw very clearly when I was raising money that um, the people who connected to this problem, mostly older women, but also uh, a good number of men uh, who understood the problem, they were, I mean, they were much more excited about investing. They still went through all the diligence. It still had to be, you know, a good financial opportunity. Um, and that, and also clinicians. So the male clinicians, if, if they have any, you know, experience, you know, medical experience, that they realize this is a big problem too. Yeah, and and that's right. It comes down to really making that making the the business case for, and there's a there is a very strong business case for supporting the innovations that um, you all are working on. And I see uh, Stephanie Sassman cheerleading in the, in the chat box there that there's an innovation innovation chasm, and we need more funders to realize it and spur research. So I really appreciate all of you joining us today, sharing the innovation side, the funding side, um, trying to solve this very meaningful um, health issue for women's health in particular, um, and, and the men, few men out there that um, suffer with bone health, and we all suffer with aging. So it's, it's, there's no other alternative. So what I'd like to do now is to pivot to our partners from G to G, and have Liz tell us what's happening on the policy side to support the work that we're talking about today. Great, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to join you all. And what I love is that there's multiple meanings for the word advocacy and really important to have that patient advocacy, speaking up for yourself, for your loved ones. I think that was emphasized beautifully at the beginning. My part of advocacy is more congressional, um, talking to government and really advocating um, for legislation, for regulations, uh, policies that can really make a difference in women's health. So um, this was mentioned earlier by the previous speakers, um, this legislation um, that, that provides uh, access to osteoporosis testing for Medicare beneficiaries, really important legislation. And when we were looking into this a little bit further, we also wanted to point out, this is not new. This was introduced the last Congress. Um, and so the 102 co-sponsors last Congress, so that really shows that there's bipartisan support for this. So 62 is a great number. I'm hoping we can get that up uh, to 100 and higher. Um, and then uh, for the Senate, it's about the same number last Congress as this Congress. So. Um, when it comes to being an advocate, that means you can contact your member of Congress to say, please co-sponsor this bill. This will make a difference for women's health. And you can easily find this on your own. You can go to house.gov, um, type in your zip code if, you don't, if you're not sure who your representative is and it will tell you. And then um, you can click on that link. And usually there's a contact me button on the homepage for the member of Congress click that and then just write your little letter um, and you will make a difference that way. And the same for your two senators. Um, we also, we looked into it, see what other bills were out there around um, women's health and aging and bone health. And there actually isn't very much, but um, there is uh, this Innovation and Aging Act and wanted to highlight it because this group is about innovation, right? We, we care about women's health, but we also wanna drive innovation. And so thought it was important to mention that there is at least something out there on that, but there really isn't much legislation as far as like hundreds of different bills around this topic. Um, which could signal a lot of things, like maybe we need to do a little bit more education um, with Congress, but it also means that the, the bills, these two bills, the one in the House and the Senate, um, S-1943 and H.R. 3517, those are really, really important, and it makes it really easy for us. We know that we just have to advocate for those two bills, um, for example. So with that, that's just a quick overview of uh, policy proposals that are out there. We'd love to go to the next slide that's more on funding. Great, so um, NIH um, has the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases in Mouthful. Um, and it's one of the 26 different institutes and centers. Um, the president's budget has a hefty amount of funding. 
676 million, which is an increase of 42 million. So that's a good sign. Um, and then within that, um, we did a deeper dive to find um, specific funding around um, mechanisms for of pain, which can lead um, to development of safer non-addictive interventions. Um, and and then there's also, um, there's a breakdown. You can read the slide, I guess, for yourself. But the, the point of it is that the top number is definitely going up and that there's this breakdown of focus areas um, that can be of interest. Um, this is not the only institute. The National Institute of Aging is another important institute uh, for this audience to know for accessing funding. Um, so you can see that the National Institute for Aging got uh, about 4 million, and uh, it also is an increase um, uh, of 112 million. Um, so I think it's important to know within NIH, there's a bit of a rift right now in the funding process that's going on because of the new ARPA-H entity that, um, oh, that President Biden has launched. So some are concerned that that's robbing money out of NIH and then some of these institutes. Um, so I do think there's strong support in Congress that they will push back and make sure that NIH gets a nice healthy boost in addition to the ARPA-H funding. So that's another sort of advocacy item that you could be talking to your members of Congress about. And then lastly is an item I think a lot of people don't realize, and that is the Department of Defense or DOD. They have tremendous funding resources for health innovation. And they have this program called CDMRP, which is Congressionally Directed Military Research Program. And that means Congress picks out the disease and conditions that they want to see funded. Now, it's still a competitive grant program, but Congress picks out the conditions. Um, and what's interesting is they actually historically did have um, a category for osteoporosis. And um, it is not among the current list now, but they do have um, this orthopedic research program that can, within that, um, entities can apply for women's health, bone health um, innovations. And so it's a good funding source. Um, this, this general pot of money is great, but a future advocacy um, effort might be, let's get that line back around um, women's bone health and um, osteoporosis. Um, there actually was a study showing that um, there's a $10 million annual medical cost for military um, when you add up lost duty time um, across all the branches from osteoporosis related um, stress fractures. So there's a nexus to the military. So with that, I just want to quickly cover that um, and pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Liz. We really appreciate the collaboration and support with G2G and helping us get those bills you know, across the line that support women's health. All right, so we are close to wrapping up here, everybody. I want to thank you so much for joining us today to, for the Women's Health Innovation Forum Series on Bone Health and Aging. I have two kind of announcements that I wanna share with you. One, our next session will be June 29th and it will be on cognitive and brain health which I think is gonna be a really interesting topic based on uh, the research that has just come out on COVID and kind of that brain health perspective and people being impacted by long COVID. I think that there's an, you know, an element around that that uh, would be interesting to touch on. And I would also like to share that the springboard will be at the LS um, US Congress in Boston uh, it's a conference that will run on June 21st to 22nd. We have discount codes for members of the coalition. If you plan to be in Boston or you would like to be there, there is a dedicated women's health CEO forum, uh, which will be an hour and a half in the afternoon on June 21st at 4 p.m. So if you're interested in joining and participating there, we will have five of our digital health um, companies that will be presenting and doing their showcase on that particular day there at 11.15. And we would love to have the room filled with supporters for them, as you know how important and challenging it is to be an entrepreneur and to have a, a crowd of people that are standing behind you like Springboard does for our entrepreneurs. Um, would love to have you there with us. So I, look for some communication from Alexandra to set, share over the list from and recording from today's call. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon.